Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Good evening. The eye wall of Hurricane Harvey has started to make landfall here on the Texas coast. Already in Corpus Christi, Texas, more than 30,000 people are without power and things are only expected to get worse. Breaking news, Hurricane Harvey barreling into the Texas coastline as a Category 4 storm with 130 mile an hour winds. It's the first Category 4 storm to hit the U.S. in over a decade. About 12 months ago, life changed for a lot of people. I got a phone call. I was the coordinator for Helping Hands. We got the phone call that the storms were coming and we might need to prepare. And over the course of 48 hours, life unfolded pretty drastically for the entire community. When the weather forecasts started coming in and we're watching that, um, I don't think you know, we were too worried or too concerned. You know, we watched it you know, with some cautiously. And uh, then s Sunday morning, uh, we noticed that there was like water up in the street already. And then slowly you just like start seeing like water kind of seep in from the sides of the walls and, and you know all of a sudden your carpet's like covered with water and you're trudging through water and then all of a sudden you start smelling stuff in your house that you know is not natural. Sunday morning, the weekend of the storm, we're not really thinking that in 24 hours from then, we're gonna be leaving out our window. You know, I'm trying to like hold it together a little bit when we're like starting to flag down a boat to come get us out of our house, right? In disbelief, I, I think we uh, were walking through it, putting one foot in front of the other, not really comprehending the magnitude of what's going on. And uh, seeing so many people being on the corner here, watching boats and people and floats and, and uh, air mattresses going by with what belongings they could take. Over the first 24 hours uh, after the storm, we were able to mobilize teams and prepare food, make sure people had a home, a, a safe shelter. Uh, the church opened the doors and it was like a floodgate. There was emotional care that was needed. There was physical care for some. Uh, there was structural care for their homes. Like that first Sunday uh, after the flood, and we had a, the service, and um, uh, you know, Pastor Ken, you know, asked people who were uh, victims or survivors, you know, to stand. Well, you know, the service that we were in, even though there were maybe I don't know, maybe 600 people at the service, there were maybe 20, 30 people stood up. And then he asked people who helped to stand up. And about 80, 90% of the congregation stood up. And it was just overwhelming because that's what we had been seeing all week. The great thing was that after after um, after the storms, everyone showed up. We had we had like 20 guys here, and we got out here at 10 o'clock in the morning. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, this house was done. You know, once the demo started, it was just community. I would say, you know, people coming in repeatedly. And I mean, even that first day, people started showing up. And then by the second day. Um, you know, we probably had 12, 15 people in the house starting to help. And throughout the whole week, we went from our house to someone else's house to someone else's house. I know I was putting in 100 hours a week, and I know there are volunteers that did that and then some because they loved the community, because they wanted to share God and take that love to the community and demonstrate God's love. It was powerful. The, the love that we were shown graciousness, um, faith bridge, I, 
they embraced us and just have loved on us in ways beyond measure. I mean, yeah. that was a hard time. I mean, it's like, like it's Kim very said. humbling um, to be able to say, yeah, I'm in need. You know, we didn't have flood insurance. Um, so how we were going to pay these people, pay contractors and, and that kind of thing to come back and start fixing the house or deal with things was a big unknown. You kind of just throw your hands up and you're like, okay, well, we might be living here a lot longer than we want to at my parents' house. to actually experience all the love that is directed at you, which I can't remember the last time I felt like that. I mean, there was just, there was a sense of caring for one another, for strangers. I think there was a, a greater need to be a human being than to be selfish during Harvey. Uh, I mean, I wish Harvey would have never happened. I wish we would have never gotten flooded. But all of the good things that have come out of this, the blessings, uh, the gifts, the, you know, just, you know, all the help, you know, and just totally eclipsed, you know, the bad part of the flood. The love that we saw there and the way it grew our faith and the building on friendships and community and, and that was that was huge and I can't look back on that and say well 2017 was a terrible year when all of that good came from that as much bad as happened but when all of that good came from that I wouldn't look back on that and say that was a bad year I think that was a year that we grew and a year that our relationships grew and a year that we saw God move in a magnificent way that we won't ever forget isn't that awesome Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. We are continuing on our path to purpose, a look at the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep. If you want to go ahead and uh, turn, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 13. We started the series uh, looking at the call of Abram. He lived in an area known as the Ur of the Chaldees, modern day Iraq, and God called him out of that land and told him, go west, young man, to a land that I will show you. And in faith and in obedience, he went. And then last week, Pastor Ken talked about how for a time, uh, Abram and his family took a slight detour during a season of famine and went down into Egypt. Things didn't go so well there. Some lessons were learned. And this week we pick up as Abram and his family are coming back out of Egypt and into the land that God had promised. We're going to begin reading in Genesis 13, verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain, and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord." 
The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house, to worship and to lift up the name of your son, Jesus. We pray now as we turn our attention to your written word that your Holy Spirit would come just as you promised to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. When I was 19 years old, I graduated from trade school and went out and got my first real job making a real salary. I started out at the whopping salary of $7.50 an hour. I was stunned. I never made that much money in my life. I was finally rolling in it. And despite the fact that I had been brought up by my parents to uh, consider things like generosity and serving others and being thoughtful of others, when I suddenly found myself awash in all of this cash, those values were the furthest thing from my mind. Because I was focused on one thing and one thing only, and that was a brand new pickup truck. It would be safe to say that I became obsessed with the notion of getting a new pickup truck. I mean, I had the worst case of new car fever. I, I, it was visceral. I, I could feel it in my gut how badly I wanted to have this truck. And I can remember leaving work in the car that I already owned, which was perfectly fine and paid for, and driving by the car lot and just looking at that truck and sometimes turning around and driving back by to look at it again. And as I felt the visceral desire to have the truck and I, and I looked on it with such longing, I began to imagine myself driving it and how incredibly cool I would look and feel driving this new truck. I mean, the message would go out to all the land. Danny Slagle has made it. <laughs> He's in a new truck. Now, my folks, uh, you know, did their best to, to slow things down, to offer words of caution. You know, re remember now, you, you've got other financial responsibilities as well, uh, not the least of which is giving back to God and other bills that you have to pay. So let, let's pray about this. Let's, let's think about this. But I'm like, ah, what do you know? I saved up my money, and as soon as I got enough for a down payment, man, I went out and I bought that thing. And it was awesome for about a month. <laughs> that thing was the biggest piece of junk. It turned out to be a lemon's lemon. I had the worst case of buyer's remorse in the history of the world. So regretted that I had done that. And so regretted that now my hands were tied to this car payment, severely limiting what else I could have done with those resources. I had fallen prey to one of the oldest, most familiar patterns of temptation known to humanity. It is described most clearly in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, where the apostle John says, watch out. There are some things out there that want to get you. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These things are from the world. They are not from God. And they are after you. And I had fallen right into that pattern. The lust of the flesh, my visceral desire to have this truck, the lust of the eyes, my inability to keep from looking at it and looking at it. And then, of course, the pride of life, my vain imagination that I would be so cool 
and so well thought of driving that truck. I was a textbook case of 1 John 2, 16. An old and familiar pattern of temptation. Matter of fact, it is the oldest pattern of temptation in the book. The oldest pattern known to humanity because the very first two human beings, Adam and Eve, fell to this line of temptation. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, the serpent is tempting Eve with the fruit of the garden, that which she has been forbidden to eat on pain of death. And the scripture says that she looked at it and saw that it would be good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and that it would be good for making one wise, the pride of life, to be wiser than everyone else. And she partook, and we know what happened thereafter. Perhaps you've heard other preachers say, you know, the devil is not very original, but he is persistent. And he runs the same play over and over and over because he knows that if he can appeal to that fundamental seed of selfishness that resides within each one of us, and begin to exploit that and leverage that, that's when he's got us. When we become completely self-absorbed, when it's all about us. In my whole experience with the truck, that was my primary problem. I was the epitome of selfishness. It was all about me and what I wanted and what I thought was going to be good for me. And what the enemy of our souls is so good at doing is getting our attention hyper-focused on something to the point that we cannot see what may be coming down the road. All we can see is what we want in the moment. And this is exactly what happened to Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. They had sojourned together from the Ur of the Chaldees and down into Egypt, and now they were coming back to Canaan. Both of them had grown very wealthy to the point that the land could not support all of their herds and flocks. And so Abram did a remarkable thing. They found a high point overlooking the Jordan Valley, and he said to his nephew, look, we're not going to make it together, so let's do this. Let's part ways but I'll give you first dibs. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. To the right, down to the south, was the lower part of the Jordan Valley, which was lush and green. The scripture says it was like the garden of the Lord. It looked like paradise. To the left, up to the north, was the hilly, rocky, arid land of Canaan. It was remarkable that Abram offered that as he did because he certainly didn't owe it to Lot. I mean, he was the superior character in the story. He's the uncle. He's the one who was called by God. He's the one who was given the promise. And yet he offers it up freely. And Lot begins to look south and he sees that lush green valley and he thinks to himself, that's exactly what my herds need. It'll be good for food for them, and then they will be good for food for me. And he looks at it, and he gazes at it, and he begins to think to himself, oh my goodness, this, this is so beautiful. It's, it's practically like paradise. I can hardly take my eyes off of it. And don't you know, that would be the perfect place for me to begin to make a name for myself. I mean, I've sort of been Abram's tag along these many days. It's time for me to step out and, and become a somebody. And what better place would I be set up for success than down there where the land is rich and fertile and green and well watered already? Yeah, Uncle Abe, I'm going that way. So be it. And at first blush, it would appear that Lot made the savvy choice. I mean, who could blame him? You're given these two options, fertile green, rocky, arid. Yeah, what are you going to take? But what Lot didn't take into account 
was that choices that are made on the basis of selfishness never lead to good things. They never lead to good things. When we begin with our self and our needs and our wants, and we are the starting point and we are the reference point for the decisions that we make, the ending is never going to be good. God has not made us to be selfish creatures. And when we choose to walk in a way that is contrary to God's will, things are never going to turn out well. They didn't turn out well in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. John is very clear. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they are a part of the world. And this world is passing away. If you put your stock in those things... It's going to be too bad for you. Things certainly didn't turn out well for Adam and Eve. Though they had been warned, they gave in to their selfish desires and found themselves expelled from the garden and doomed to a life of suffering and ultimately death. Things sure didn't turn out well for me either with that stupid truck. And they didn't turn out well for Lot. Because if we read a little further on, into Genesis, we see that no sooner had Lot moved down to that preferred land than suddenly he was attacked by warlords, kidnapped. He and his family hauled off and all of their possessions taken. And he moved, of course, into the worst possible neighborhood. It was already well known that Sodom and Gomorrah were the two most wicked cities in the world, but he turned a blind eye to that fact because it was all about him. And yet, a day came that God pronounced judgment on those cities. And when he began to rain down judgment on them, as Lot and his family were running away, his wife just couldn't bring herself to leave, and she died. His selfishness yielded horrible, horrible consequences. They always do. You can write it down. If my starting point is me, and what's best for me. And if I'm always looking out for number one, sooner or later, things are not going to go well. I remember some years ago, uh, a fella came to see me who was in the throes of this threefold pattern of temptation. From the outside, he seemed to have the world by the tail. Everything looked pretty good on the outside but scratched the surface and it wasn't so great. His primary complaint was uh, the situation at home. I said, well, tell me about it. What's, what's, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, the spark just isn't there anymore. And the kids, it just seems like they always want something of me. You know, really, Pastor Dan, home just seems like a lot of work. I thought, well... Marriage is work. Parenting is work. What were you expecting, you know? Ah, he wasn't happy with that and said, oh, but I'll tell you the one shining spot in my life, that, that is at my real work, at my job. Oh, things are just taking off there. I am achieving every day. I am setting new records. Uh, people are telling me constantly, I've got such an amazing future with this company that I'm going places, I'm making more and more money. You know, I'm, I'm getting lots of strokes there, but when I go home, I don't get anything but a hassle. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> Among the many cheerleaders that he had at work was a pretty little young thing about 20 years his junior, who knew just how to flatter him and make him feel better about himself. And when he brought her up, that's when Pastor Dan began to wag the finger. You better watch out, buddy. You better watch out. Satan is lurking. You better be careful. And even though he knew better, even though he knew better, he gave in to the lust of the flesh. He desired this woman. He gave in to the lust of the eyes. He never missed an opportunity to just be where she happened to be. 
And of course, the pride of life was right there thinking, oh my goodness, how awesome would I look with this sweet young thing on my arm? And he left his family, he left his wife, and he left his kids to take up with this girl. What he didn't take into account was that one day, uh, the little trophy girlfriend just might go looking for her own trophy boyfriend, which she did, and decided she was tired of this old guy, ready for some real companionship. And when he tried to go back home to make things right, the door was shut, and those relationships were gone. Looking after number one never works. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen next year. But at some point in time, if we're putting ourselves first, there is going to be a price to pay. Now, contrast that approach to life, which begins with me, to the life of Abram who, though not a perfect man by any stretch, was a selfless man and a generous man and a man who was willing to serve his nephew. Freely, he offers the land. You take what you want and I'll take what's left. What was it that was operative in his life that made him be generous? What was it that set him apart from Lot that permitted him to be selfless and serving instead of grasping and greedy and selfish. The first thing I noticed about Abram was that instead of indulging the lust of the flesh, he used his energies to worship God. Two times in this short little chapter, we are told that Abram worshiped in verses 4 and in verses 18. We're told that he called upon the name of the Lord and then he built an altar and worshiped God. You know, whatever has your attention has you. And what had Lot's attention was the land and what it would do for him. But what had Abram's attention was God. And when we're focused on God, he begins to change us from the inside out. It's spending time in the presence of God whereby we become like God. God. He rubs off on us. His priorities become our priorities. His holiness becomes our holiness. His desires become our desires. His priorities become our priorities. You know, the most challenging idol, the most tempting idol that you and I will ever face, more so than money or sex or power or fame, the most powerful one in all of the world is the one that's in the mirror, the one we look at most every day. Looking after ourselves is our priority in life. And it's only by the grace of God as we submit to him and commit to making him first that he's able to turn our attention away from the ever-present lure of self it's only by his grace that we are able to make him the object of our worship, to put him before everything else and to trust him with our future. Abram was more concerned about knowing and loving and pleasing and worshiping God than he was about getting his own needs met. Not only that, um, Abram was not near as entranced with the green valley as Lot was. The lust of the eyes had held no appeal for him because he was more focused on the unseen than the seen. He could look beyond the green grass and the well-watered fields and see something else. That's why Paul in the book of Romans calls him the father of all of us who walk by faith. God is beckoning each and every one of us to lift up our heads, 
to quit paying attention to whatever that thing is that has us so absorbed in the moment and to look up and to see, oh, you've got something else for me out there, something bigger, something better than I ever imagined possible. Now, I understand that by and large, we have to live our lives in the seen world, you know, the real physical, tangible world. I understand that that's where we live most of our lives. I mean, if I'm on the side of the road and a car is barreling toward me, I'm not going to stand there and say, sorry, I live in the unseen. I may become unseen at that point. No, I'm going to get out of the way. But I also know this, in the life of every believer, there come those special moments those points in time where God says, I want you to look past what you can see to what you can't see, namely me. I want you to trust me. I want you to pursue me. I want you to believe that I can do things for you that you could never imagine. About 16 or so years ago, my good buddy Ken Warline gave me a call and invited me to come join the staff of his fledgling young church called Faith Bridge. There were lots and lots of reasons not to. Becky and I were living in Atlanta, Georgia at the time where, where we are from. We had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn. All of our family and friends lived there. That's where we had lived our whole lives. My district superintendent had just offered me a, a, a new appointment, a new church, a good-sized church up in the North Georgia mountains, a beautiful location, preaching to more people than I had ever preached to before, which to a preacher's ears is music. I remember as we were going to bed that first night, I mentioned to Becky, hey, um, what would you think about moving to Texas? Without hesitating, she said, I hope you have a good time. When I brought it up with my district superintendent, he said, Texas, don't you know there are parts of that state that haven't even been settled yet? <laughs> but Becky and I agreed that we would pray about it. And as we began to pray, both of us began to sense that God was calling us to something that we could not see. Oh, all that we could see looked great. Family, friends, job security. I mean, there, there was certainly no guarantees that all would work out here that the church would make it, or that Ken and I would be able to work together. Sometimes friendships don't do so well in the workplace. Lots of ifs and maybes and unknowns. But as we prayed it through and talked to God about it, both of us began to just sense with every passing month, no, I'm calling you to something that you can't see, Dan, but you're going to have to trust me. And I can tell you that the last 16 years have been the most satisfying, enjoyable, productive, meaningful years of our lives. We have made friends out here that have become like family to us. I have preached to more people here and around the globe in the last 16 years than I would have in a lifetime back in Georgia. My daughters have had the privilege of growing up in our kids' ministry and in our student ministry and going trips on the road, learning about the world and about serving Christ in ways they never could have back home. No, God has done far beyond what I could have possibly thought or imagined as we chose to focus on the unseen instead of the seen. I wonder today, what is it that God is lifting your head to look at? Is there some possibility out there? And the still small voice of the Spirit is saying, don't look right in front of you. Look to me. Even if you can't see me, trust me. So Abram did not give in to the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes. And, you know, the pride of life was really not an issue for him. Now, I can see how it would have been an issue for Lot. I, I, I can understand that. He had been playing second fiddle to Abram all these years. And he was ready to step out on his own and make a name for himself. 
But I also notice that when Abram made the offer, there was no hesitation. There wasn't even the courtesy of stepping back and saying, oh, no, 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 no. Uncle Abe, I could never do that. No, he was like, yeah, got it, go it. It was all about him. But Abram uh, understood something that Lot did not. You see, when the, when the focus of our lives is on the pride of life, on making it all about us, what we don't take into account is that moving forward, everything then is up to us. Win or lose, succeed or fail, whatever the outcome may be, it's up to us when we're hanging our hat on pride. But what Abram understood was that if my trust is not in pride, but in the promise that God has given to me, everything is then up to God. Abram could offer generously, freely, without hesitation, because he knew behind him he had the greatest collateral in the world. God Almighty was backing him up, and he was trusting in that promise not seeking to build his own kingdom, not seeking to make it all about himself. Abram really was a remarkable man. And I think for at least one reason, among many others, the reason his story is included in here is to teach us, this is the kind of person I want you to be. But as great as he was, and as many things as there are to learn from Abram's life, really, he just served as a pointer. A pointer to one who's even greater. His life was a pointer to the Lord Jesus, who also demonstrated to us a life of selflessness and serving others. You see, every single one of us Every single one of us, every person who's ever lived at some point in time has said to God, no thanks. Even though you created me and you're the author of all life, I'm going to go my own way. Thanks. But what we don't take into account is that when we separate ourselves from the source of life, the only other option is death. We have all doomed ourselves to an eternal death, and there's not one blessed thing we can do about it. But Jesus, for no compelling reason other than the fact that he loved us, left the glory of heaven and came to get us. He came to rescue us from a situation from which we could not rescue ourselves giving no thought to himself, but thinking of us. And on the last night of his earthly life, he found himself in a garden. And he knew what was coming the next day. He knew that the only thing that awaited him was a cross. And there was nothing about that cross that was appealing to his flesh. And he certainly didn't relish the idea of looking at it. Nor is there anything to be proud of about hanging, dying naked in the Palestinian sun on a cross. All of these things were passing through Jesus' mind. He knew what was coming. And the temptation was there. Look after yourself, look after your own skin, look after yourself. You don't owe these people anything. They're the ones who got themselves into this pickle. You owe them nothing. Save yourself. But Jesus was able to look beyond all of that. He was able to look beyond the cross to the will of his Father. And say to him, not my will, but your will be done. And he was able to look even further beyond the cross and beyond obedience to his father, to you and to me. And with a heart of love for us, he endured the cross and he scorned its shame. 
And because he chose to be selfless instead of selfish, the hope of eternal life is ours. And it would have come to us no other way. Maybe you're here today and you're hearing that for the first time. Or maybe you've heard it a lot of times, but it's never clicked, but today it did. In a few minutes, we're going to pray. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to talk to Jesus about what he has done for you. Now, some of you listening to this sermon may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, good for Abram and good for Jesus, but my gracious, a lot. I, I could never serve on that scale. I, I don't have lots of land to give away. I certainly can't offer salvation to anyone. What, what good will my serving do? Well, it has nothing to do with quantity or quality or size. It has everything to do with obedience. It has everything to do with the state of your heart. Serving is not about achieving anything. It's about paying attention to what is right in front of you and doing what Jesus would do in that situation. In your bulletin, you should find a slim little card like this. If, if you would, please take that out. You're going to find on both sides of this card any number of opportunities available for service. And maybe for some of you, th this is going to be your first step into a life of serving, of sacrificing time and energy to give to somebody else. And they range all the way from our parking ministry, which keeps us safe getting in and out of here, to the grounds ministry, which keeps the place looking so beautiful, to our hospitality team, which makes sure that we have coffee and donuts every week. And on the back, um, you know, our kids in student ministry are always in need of adults. They're always in need because those ministries are so successful. They're growing by leaps and bounds. And kids need adults in their lives who will give of their time and experience and love to help them along the way. I'm going to give us a few minutes to look this over. And if you would, as you're looking it over and considering, um, I want you to write your name and your contact information. Now, let me explain. This, this is not a commitment card. This is an expressing interest card. And as you leave, you'll be dropping it in a basket at the door, and we'll be in touch with you about your interest. But if you have questions about what these involve, in the East Atrium, we have tables set up and individuals there representing each and every ministry who can answer all of your questions and tell you all about what those ministries do on campus and off campus. Those of you that are in Center Court West, when the service is over, make your way past party on the patio and come on over to the East Atrium. This is an opportunity for us in a very small way, really, to say to the Lord Jesus, uh, it, it's not going to be just about me. No, I'm going to make it about somebody else. I'm going to make it about something else. I'm going to make it about you before I make it about me. We're going to take a minute and pray as you finish these, and um, then we'll be dismissed. But I do hope you'll give some serious prayerful consideration to how you might be a servant. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that when we were at our most desperate, you were not selfish. But in the greatest selfless act in history, you came after us. Your son Jesus came for us. And if you were one of those people who heard that story of Jesus and you're feeling the tug of the Spirit on your heart, I want to invite you now to open your heart wide and let him in. He wants to love you and forgive you and continue to serve you. 
And for those of us who know Jesus, this is another opportunity to walk in his steps and be his disciple, to serve others and to serve our world, which desperately needs to hear from Jesus. Thank you, God, for raising up Faith Bridge and for making Faith Bridge a kind of church where we don't sit and wonder and wait, but we get up and we do because that's what you've called us to do. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Go in peace. May God bless you as you go forth to serve. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Pastor Dan Slagle who just preached part three of our Abraham series, a sermon all about moving from selfishness to selflessness. Pastor Dan, thank you so much for being here with us thank today. You. Uh, we had a couple questions come in, so I'm just gonna, just gonna fire them off. Okay. Uh, so the first one, uh, someone asked, uh, if God did not create us to be selfish, uh, then why is it our human nature uh, to be selfish, even from a very young age? Where did that come from? Sure. Well, uh, he's absolutely right in the first half of the question. God did not create us to be selfish, sure. but uh, we have all been infected with a sin nature. Uh, that is simply endemic right. to the human situation yeah. that uh, from birth forward, we are sinful, selfish creatures. And so it comes as no surprise yeah. that an infant's first words are mine. Sure. It, you know, We start exhibiting it very early and it's a battle we fight. Some fight throughout their lives. Right. Uh, others, I suppose, revel in it. <laughs> uh, but if we're following Christ anyway and seeking to grow in sanctification, it, it, it's a battle we fight throughout our lives. Well, it makes sense when you think about it's our sin that introduced death into the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's death that produces that, uh, that feeling of self-preservation. That's right. Right, and, yeah. which leads to the selfishness. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. I think it is, it's our sin nature which then brings out that selfishness in us. And it's, it is strange how you can see it from such early, early ages. Early on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this next question uh, is one that uh, I'm excited to hear this side of the story as well. What is Becky's side of the story about the move from Atlanta to Texas? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, at, at the risk of putting words in my wife's mouth, I think I can safely say um, she was reluctant at first. Mm -hmm. Because as I mentioned, Atlanta is home. Sure. Uh, and the thought of leaving all that was familiar and certainly the thought of leaving family when we had three small children was not one she was excited about. But we took a whole year to pray about it. Mm. And with every passing month, we got a new green light mm. that, that came in all shapes and sizes. Yeah. Everything from my, my bishop giving me blessing to, to going, yeah. Uh, to uh, the sale of our homes working out, you know, just lots sure. of, of different things. I remember after we had been here for about th oh, four or five weeks, I guess, we were driving up Champion Forest Drive uh, right there in front of Kroger, yeah. and Becky looked at me kind of sideways and said, uh, are you missing home? And I said, no, I'm really not. Yeah. And we both felt kind of guilty, actually, <laughs> that sure, we yeah. were not more homesick. Sure. But uh, God just has confirmed over and over uh, since we've been here that this, this was the place He had in mind for us. And I think if she were sitting here, she would wholeheartedly affirm that. I think that too. I believe that too. Well, Dan, thank you so much yeah. uh, for sharing with us. And thank you so much for your sermon. It was great. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.